believe it or not, when someone is making a bold choice, they are very anxious. I was very anxious and a bit scared. And then I realized, no, the world didn't swallow me up. No one died. So it's actually okay. And I encouraged myself. What is it that I'm actually looking for? Do we really know life? Sure. But let me say intelligence. Emotional intelligence, social intelligence, financial intelligence. So I believe it's important for each and every one of us to understand the rules that govern any arena of your life. You are listening to The Revenge of the Forsaken Gods, a podcast that explores the human experience and seeks to create a blueprint for living using books, stories, movies, and conversations. And here is your host, Andrew Balongo Opere. Yes, welcome to the Revenge of the Forsaken Gods, and I am your host, Andrew Balongo Opere, and this is a special edition of the podcast. What I decided to do is I wanted to find out what makes us make the choices that we make in life. Can we change? These are some of the questions that I wanted to explore, and in doing this, I invited a friend of mine who is a who has a background in psychology and I thought she'd be the best person to have this conversation with. And we're actually going through a book that's uh, talking about change. And so this is going to be a very interesting uh, podcast teaching you how you make your decisions, what could be the factors that make you make the decisions that you're making and can you change your choices. Without further ado, let me welcome the very famous Lynn. <laughs> Welcome, thank, Lynn. Thank you very much, Andrew. Shall I call you Dr. Lynn since you are a Don't psychologist? Don't call me doctor just yet. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I thought psychologists are doctors. No, well, that is if you have your doctorate, which I do not yet have. I have a master's, but one day I will have that doctorate. Okay. Thank you for inviting me on the show. Sure. And, and what was the inspiration for you coming to talk about this particular topic about uh, making choices and making changes in our lives. Um, it's interesting that you asked that, Andrew. I, I always think that we are always making choices, choices that we are aware of and others that we are not aware of. In other words, conscious and subconscious. So I wanted to just have an avenue where I could try and see if I can help in any way, give some information, explore further with you, um, yeah, because life is about choices. And I think for me, what uh, attracted me uh, to this book was the language. Just the fact that it took me through the stages of how you make choices. None of the adults in my life have ever given me that choice. And I was just surprised how, for example, when we want to make a change in our life, we're going to feel scared. There's anxiety. Because you're already weighing the responsibility of the transformation needed or the new place that you're going to be. So that started making sense to me. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, I've gone through that through my life. Like, for example, I remember when I when I changed religions, I was Catholic and then uh, uh, I became a, a Pentecostal Christian. I remember I was scared to tell my parents. So even just making that transition, that change in my life, it made me realize that there are two aspects to change that we need to consider this self-esteem and other esteem mm -hmm. you know obviously self-esteem has got everything to do with me but then other esteem is my relationship with those around me you know in that case my parents so I remember my mom was like why are you doing this what's wrong and uh, i didn't know how to explain it to her and my dad was just like as long as you're doing well in school that's what matters mm -hmm. So just the fact that this book gave me the step-by-step, -step, uh, um, it showed me how I made my choices. So I, I didn't beat myself, I didn't feel bad about the choice I made. So that's the reason why I'm doing this, so that I can, we can explore this, how we make choices, uh, so that we can, I can be a better person, and maybe anyone, uh, whoever's listening, they can be given the tools to understand the choices they're making in their life and how to make the changes they want on their terms. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's interesting <clears throat> that you say that, Andrew. I think um, it'd be good to keep five things in mind when we try to address choice, you know, survival, 
uh, love, feeling, having a feeling of belonging, um, power, because we also want to feel we have some form of control over what is either happening to us or what we are doing. Um, and fun, you know, believe it or not, uh, we are supposed to enjoy the lives that we are living, you know, at least to some extent. <laughs> so we need to try and see how now choice plays a part in all those five tenets, you know, a feeling of belonging, love, power, survival, and fun. Mm. Um, and I think it's also good if I can just use some of my own stories growing up. I'm a firstborn uh, of six. So whether I liked it or not, I was responsible <laughs> for all those behind me. And um, even growing up, I, I realized, wow, even my parents are sort of like firstborns. You know, my mom was the firstborn girl, uh, thirdborn in the family. My dad is like the secondborn son, but thirdborn in the family. But anyway, back to me. So I sort of tended to grow up faster. I remember at some point being told when I was in class five, you behave so maturely like you're in class eight. And I thought, wow, okay. So I should, you know, continue doing what I'm doing. Um, wanting to do the right things, always seeking approval. And you, you know, it's reinforced. When you do something good, then someone tells you, okay, go on, I'll help you or I'll give you this later on. But also I realized, even growing up, that I'd always have these few questions on why. Why should I do this? What happens if I don't do this? Will the world come to an end? I'll try it. So with choice, if you're also bold enough to just do some things, and you know, so long as you don't fear uh, the repercussions you know, or the consequences, it's also a learning curve. Um, I remember in high school, in Form 3, I was a house prefect. Then we were having elections for house captain. And uh, during assembly, the deputy headmistress was like, we need leaders who are willing to help. And I remember quoting her in the house meeting, and I told them, I'm not willing to serve this house. And everyone was shocked. I think people assumed I'm always the yes girl. Lane, do this, yes, yes. So I said, this time, I actually choose not to. And it's when I realized you also have some form of power when you can actually say yes and no to some things. And of course, I thought I could pull the same stunt with the music cop, but no, I ended up being the music prefect. <laughs> actually, it was my teacher who was like, oh, you refused to be house captain. Okay, you will be music prefect, whether you like it or not. But anyway, I guess what I'm trying to just say is that depending on where you are in life and depending on how you've been brought up, if you had support, it will either make your chances higher of maybe making a good or positive or better choice vis-a-vis -vis someone who hasn't had that. So it's also good to just look at different scenarios. I don't know what you think, Andrew. Um, yeah, I find that interesting because when I... When I look at the the factors that you you shared earlier, you know, survival, love and belonging, power, achievement, freedom, or independence and fun, what I'm getting is if we co to consider like you know all those factors, you saw that this being a cop wasn't going to be fun at mm, all. So, at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see why you you didn't choose it, and I, I guess you know you really didn't need it for your survival. Um, but I would say you probably accepted it because of the sense of belonging. I wouldn't say power, achievement, really, or freedom or independence. But uh, you know, it's one of those. Sometimes you make a decision because of the group. You know, like I shared mm -hmm. earlier, there's mm -hmm. the decision you make for yourself, but also there's a decision in relation to others and your environment. Yeah. So the reality is, our decisions impact others and others impact our decisions. Mm -hmm. So I can see why uh, you are influenced to become the music cop. Yeah, because, well, <clears throat> by default, I was doing the course till the end of mm -hmm. high school, and we were only four. So I think out of the four is the more better <laughs> <laughs> choice. Yeah. As, as it makes sense, because now if we, can, if we can look at it from the eyes of the administrators or the teachers, mm -hmm the most qualified and you know the only four of you and I think that's also something I'd like to bring out 
you know, in terms of making choices that while it is all about me, it's also not all about me. While making a choice is all about you, it's also not all about mm-hmm. you. Like for example, if you're an employee and you're thinking, okay, fine, whatever it is you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. the tasks that you have to do, yeah. you're thinking that that's the only thing that matters. And not realizing that also everything you do affects your boss and the, the organization. It flourishing and not flourishing. It is one of the factors. Yeah. It is not the factor. So it's made me realize how choices are just not made in a vacuum. Like it's all about me. You know, I don't care what you think or how it's going to affect you. We have to consider <coughs> that. I guess it's part of the process of making uh, choices. Mm-hmm. And the word informed <coughs> choices which basically means you've either gotten some more knowledge on that choice, um, what it entails, you know, what it will give you in return. And um, uh, yeah, it all depends on that again. Um, So I think also as an individual, it's always good if you're aware. What am I getting myself into if I choose this way instead of that way? And also they are timely choices, you know. Again, for something for high school, it's only for that period of four years. When you leave high school, then there's college again. You know, if it has been the pattern of you holding leadership positions or being involved in um, certain, you know, extracurricular activities, clubs, do you continue with that pattern in university, then work life? You find even there are some people in work who have to be in some form of club. If it's not a sport club, um, what do you call them, indoor games like Scrabble or chess, or just to name a few. And uh, there's that thing of anxiety. Believe it or not, when someone is making a bold choice, they are very anxious. I was very anxious and a bit scared. And then I realized, no, the world didn't swallow me up. No one died. So it's actually okay, and I encouraged myself. It depends on what point you are in your life, and ask, if you can ask. It's actually not wrong to ask. I learned for the first time, it's actually not wrong. It's not a sin to ask, why? Why should I do this if I'm being told? And what used to always frustrate me is like if I'm told no, with no good reason, and I want to try and explore that further, I'm like, uh, Like, if I want to change this course, I actually wanted to change my courses in university. And I was told by one of the heads of department, no, you can't do this. And I'm like, but I can, the units are the same. I just need to change. And I ended up realizing, okay, it's dictatorial. It's our way or the highway. So if you can't do that, you have to ask yourself, can I withstand, can I, you know, bumilia for a while doing this? If I'm not happy, then you have to leave because you won't be able to live any other life. But also these things come also with age. As we grow older, we find we are able to make more more informed and sane decisions, you know, as opposed to others, you know. Things like going to the club or having to have your drink. Must you have so much? Just take enough that you can tolerate because what's the point in drinking until you're incapacitated or you start, you know, vomiting or things like that. So. Yes, when you're also choosing things, there's also that aspect of, I'm I'm curious, what will happen if I take this, if I do this? So long as it's not a lethal choice, and unfortunately there are some who've um, experimented in some things and have died from it, and they haven't been able to come back and tell us this is what it was like in the process of dying. Yes, and I find that interesting because now, you see, for example, if we had been like scientists, we'd have been testing on rats so that we can see how the rats are behaving. <laughs> so we're getting data of <laughs> what yeah. they experienced before that death happened. But anyway, mm. um, yeah, the main goal of this whole experience is to increase um, the awareness of who you are and how you relate to the world and how you see choices that are open to you so that you can experience growth on your terms. And I noticed some interesting questions came about as I was just uh, uh, doing some research. Uh, do you have a choice in changing your life? How do you examine your values and your behavior? What crisis have you faced? How did this crisis affect your life? 
and how did they represent a significant turning point for you? Now, these questions have been mind-blowing for me because they've made me really think about my life. But how have these questions informed some of the people who've inspired the ideas around personal growth and making choices? Mm-hmm. Okay. Nina, you know, it's interesting when you mention personal growth, maybe we should even start there. What is personal growth? Personal meaning me, mine, you know, and growing, you know, um, moving from one stage to another. So in my case, believe it or not, learning to be a psychologist, it was mandatory that I and every other fellow student undergo personal therapy, they called it. So the, the logic behind it is that you also need to understand yourself, know the um, how far you've come in life before you can also use that approach on others. And that made sense, but it was also very interesting because in the process of therapy, I realized, wow, some things I didn't know about myself. And I always had suspicions that I was always dealing with anxiety growing up. I just had a good way of hiding it. And I came to learn that actually a little anxiety is not bad. The same way we're told, a little stress is not bad. It'll either motivate you a bit or inspire you to do something or to move from point A to point B. For most psychologists, you know, tackling the aspect of change, they've been the earlier schools of thought as they are called, or models, or approaches to understanding human behavior and choice. One of them being Alfred Adler, who was a very sickly child. He almost died from the uh, from pneumonia at the age of four. And he grew up in a family where his parents were quite critical of him also. So I think in his own growth and development is when he realized, no, I have to try and address this. I have to try and see how we can become better human beings. We can become better placed to handle situations and how we behave as a result or in response to those situations. You have the likes. uh, So he came up with um, a sense of having community, community feeling and social interest. So again, boost your self-esteem so that not only are you able to function as a fully functioning person, but I can also function well with another human being or I can also impart that which I have learned to them. You have other, other people like um, Carl Jung um, who also focused on on the individual getting to know their inner selves, you know, knowing who they're Carl real. Young. He was also a psychologist, uh, one of Adler's contemporaries. And also he now focused that, uh, he focused on individuals during their middle adult years. Now for him, it was more of dealing with middle adult is what, ages 40, maybe 35 to 55 years of age. And from his own studies, he realized that is the time when human beings are trying to be, or trying to achieve a lot of stability of some sort in their work, family life maybe, um, basically in society. So it's like, and by then they should have found a sense of fulfillment or at least being able to be strong enough to withstand, strong enough to understand when this happens, this is what is happening to me, or I'm responding this way to the environment. Again, for him also, a bit of a troubled family, which seems to be the norm for many, you know. Uh, You find parents, the parents ended up divorcing because they were also not able to cope with each other. So again, he used his own family experience. Um as an experiment to see, okay, if parents are able to discuss more openly, they're more understanding of each other, then even human beings can function more better. So that's the second school of thought. The third one is Carl Rogers, whom I also tend to like, because his his theory or model is called the person-centered therapy. So again, for a person to be able to fully function in life and be satisfied, they have to grow and develop in an environment where there are three factors. They should experience empathy. Empathy is that feeling of 
I feel like I'm in your shoes. Not sympathy, but I feel like I am walking in your shoes. What's the difference between empathy and sympathy? Sympathy is pity. You pity someone, but you're not in their shoes. You're detached, so to speak. So empathy is more of like, we are together in this. Of course, maybe the therapist or someone offering that may not actually be in the sense, but they're supposed to portray that. So that's one of the requirements, if I can call them. The second requirement is, of course, to have unconditional positive regard, regardless of your color, race, status in life. Unconditional positive regard. And the third one is genuineness, because that can't happen if you're not genuine. Genuine is being real. Yeah. So a person can only fully function and be of use to another person or society or community when they have those three things around them. Empathy, unconditional positive regard, and genuineness. So if you were to think of the opposite of that, someone who's not empathetic, mm. that causes pain and hurt. Someone who doesn't give unconditional. People help when they give conditions and they tell you, I'll only help you if you do this for me. If it's a condition that can't be met, then you're at a disadvantage. Um, genuineness. How many people can we say today are real, genuine? Are we genuine about what we do, what we say, how we behave? So that's a challenge. But I like that therapy because I feel if we as human beings, every one of us can actually exhibit or portray that, the world would be a better place. You won't have issues like corruption and too much greed, an imbalance of resources in the country or wherever you are, even in the family, you find some members want to outshine the others, you know, and let others suffer. So and and, and, and I appreciate when you share that because I can see in fact, you know, just within the African setup, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't grow up with a lot of positive what do you call it? Unconditional yeah, positive, positive regard. regard. You know, being, even if you look at around the world, uh, having dark skin is not seen as a positive mm -hmm. thing. Like even this uh, minister, this president that's accepting these Ukraine refugees, you can see how they are mentioning that, oh, these refugees uh, are intelligent. You know, they're not like these other ones that we're used to getting. And you can see how yeah. Africans have had a hard time accessing services and that's just like one example you know there's so many examples where growing up you know i've had stories of where being african or dark skinned is subpar and when i see the examples of people who are thriving there are people who are light skinned like in magazines uh, you know to the point i've seen people bleaching so you know i, I see how those, those factors affect each other because that's not genuine mm -hmm. And, and, and obviously that person not being empathetic. So I can see how this can definitely affect people to not regard their environment, you know, mm -hmm. as a safe because I'm always trying to be better, yeah. you know, to prove something to you. Yeah. You know, and I do see this uh, around, you know, in media. If you're not having this guy, you're not cool. Mm -hmm. If you're not uh, at this club, you're not cool. If you're not at this restaurant, you're not cool. Mm -hmm. Or worse yet, if you're not of this ethnic tribe, yes, ethnic, not of this ethnic you know, tribe, or you yes. find, you know, even like certain universities, you find, oh, maybe this is predominantly of one ethnic origin. Yes. You find staff are majority this if you stand out they're like wait are you sure you're not from this tribe are you sure you're sure it's like they doubt they think you're hiding yes, yes. Again. and uh are, are all of the people who have uh, theories are uh, only men there are no women that, that share their thoughts i was actually getting there <laughs> <laughs> there's natalie rogers who now was the daughter of carl rogers you know the one whom i mentioned about person-centered therapy now she was fortunate to have a father like that now, the only hitch in her case was that, again, being a woman, a woman even then in the West during this period of, you know, early 70s, late 70s, early 80s, women still didn't feel like they had a place and she felt more could be done. So what she came up with was now expressive 
person-centered therapy. So she used what her father had come up with, the three tenets, which was uh, conditional positive regard, um, genuineness and empathy, and now used art in it to make it more expressive. So as a symbol, so be it making things out of clay, for example, or uh, painting, coloring, music, whatever form of art, even dance, whatever form of art the person chooses and is able to use it to display those three uh, important points, then the person can actually even have a more fulfilling life. And um, that actually makes sense even today. You find there are some people who are even able to work well when they are listening to certain kinds of music, whether it's soothing, whether it's classical, instrumental. There is music that is upbeat that makes them, okay, I have energy to do my masonry or carpentry work. The soothing one is after a long day or when I'm contemplating what I'll do tomorrow. If it's a writer, let's say for example, they need to be in a certain environment so that they can get ideas for their next book. Also, um, actresses and actors, which brings me to the other therapy called psychodrama. So Moreno, Zeka Moreno and her husband, Lee Moreno, they worked together to see now how you can use play, the whole point of acting and acting out various human scenarios, emotions and learning from that. So that's where you can get things like role playing. I mean, if someone wants to imagine or see what life would be, I don't know, as a pirate, and they can't actually go to where pirates are. You know, let's say you live in a landlocked country, you need to be by the sea. Then it depends what kind of pirate you want to be. You know, there's Somali pirate and then there's <laughs> Jack Sparrow. <laughs> you can, yes. So they use drama plays, scenarios as a way, a forum now. To offer therapy so if you had the person who had an issue and instead of maybe being talked to like how these earlier Adler and you would talk to these ones would use more of art therapy you know drama dance and help you understand oh okay so this is my scenario okay and even better they even get you to do the acting yourself so it's like you almost get uh, a second chance at living your life if it's possible you know act out like, and that's how you have things like, uh, and you can tell me, in marketing and coaching, where you're told, practice how you're going to talk at this interview. or And you actually do it beforehand at home, in front of the mirror, in front of the camera. These were fathers and mothers of those approaches. Mm. Yeah. Wow, I can see how that's actually been used nowadays. Like, if you're looking for a job, you have mm. to practice, you know, the kind of interview questions you could be given yes, exactly. and how you're going to respond. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in sales and you're being told you have to go out and you know sell this product, mm -hmm. you have to try and practice your your lines. Yeah. How you're going to speak to the prospective customers, and you have to try and anticipate uh, whatever kind of responses they're going to give mm -hmm. you. If they reject you, what are you going to say? Or are you just going to cry and say, "Oh, okay, I didn't make the sale. Sorry." You know, there are ways of overcoming those uh, mm -hmm. rejections. Yes. yes. And and. and uh, Hopefully trying to get the sale for the product or service that you're selling. Yes, true. I didn't know a lot of these things were inspired from a lot of these uh, approaches. Yes, that's true because, I mean, what, after all, what is human behavior or, you know, a combination of what we think, what we do, you know, and what we feel in the process of it all. Yeah, that's psychodrama from the word psycho meaning mind mm -hmm. and drama, which means acting out. Yeah, and then you have uh, this lady called Virginia Satir. Now, her emphasis was more on family dynamics and her approach was more on experiential, meaning experience it in the here and now and this is what you should say to each other. So even in her own um, family situation, interactions with other people, she would get families to sit down. Everyone has a role, father, mother, or if it's a single parent, family uh, with the children and get each one of them to communicate to the other each one is given a turn and again through it all you still 
ensure you know give them their dignity let them finish talking be clear in what you're saying and use here and now don't refer to the past what happened yesterday is there right now like andrew what are you feeling right now and you explore that so for mm-hmm. us was more of the here and now i think that's powerful because what comes to mind is when i remember the conflicts i've had especially the females always bring the past mm-hmm. but there's you know there's this like popular saying that we can we can forget we can forgive but we'll never forget mm-hmm. So I guess I can see how that mindset will not really allow healing yes to happen or open communication because mm-hmm. there's no empathy yeah because if you're still holding the past against someone how can we move forward mm-hmm. so I can that, that's yeah. true no 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 that's that's very true yeah so you see the thing with all these uh, therapists they are all based on humanistic it's addressing the human person but you find one had to start off somewhere with only this information as time went by years went on this other person who took over was able to to make more changes you know and i believe there was choice to do that otherwise without the choice to do that we probably would have been stuck in the caveman years so to speak yeah so and and, and one of the interesting things uh picked just from you sharing all this is the element of learning which i notice is not emphasized a lot yes we go to school to learn or even in life we learn but the mechanics of learning are not really emphasized so you'll find words being splashed around like being self aware mm-hmm. but what do you mean being self aware you know i'm here but what does that really mean and it it shows that you know actually being an active learner you have to assume uh, responsibility for your education that mm-hmm. means like whatever that is presented to you can you take advantage of it can you absorb it to you in a way that's meaningful to you and i realize that sometimes school does not give us the tools to extract the 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 power of that environment you know mm-hmm. the lessons that we can really get from from the school experience like you know sometimes they're not asked like what do you want to get out of college or life in general like after this experience what should you be having obviously you'll get the degree yes that mm-hmm. is guaranteed but what tangible experience or what experience would you like to experience or have gone through while being in school and you know things like identifying clarifying and reaching goals in line with what you want to experience in life and that's why i'm not surprised that people find it hard to get a clear sense of their values when they're being asked what's what are your values mm-hmm. or what do you want to accomplish uh, people don't know and i notice that they're kind of you know some questions you can ask like Uh, what am i doing now like the thing that i'm doing now is it what i want to be doing mm-hmm. or better yet right you now. asked where do you want to see yourself in 5 years yeah i'm like or 10 years that's a hard question and it's very yeah, vague it's very vague yeah mm-hmm. and then like the thing now that i'm doing does it reflect my values and then do i believe i have the right to make my own choices I think that's a powerful yeah. question then, right there. Again then Andrew, again and is that as you're saying all that and you're thinking about that you always have to keep in mind time. Because unless something is instant like I'm hungry right now. Am I am I able do I have the choice I'm going to get something to eat and you know feel that hunger need right now or Am I assured I'll get a job or will this job take me for the period I need it to take me and you know so even values over time as we go through life experience in fact that's as you're talking I was thinking experience itself will tell you in its own time or even show you what kind of a person you are you know what do you mean by that well for one if you were to compare yourself and your yourself 10 years ago would you have seen yourself having a podcast like this holding this why is that no let's just explore <laughs> why is that 
You see, again, we can't see the future. Sometimes some questions, I get, they're, they're meant well, and again, depending on your line of work, maybe. If you're in construction, maybe, and I'll give an example, and you're told, uh, where do you see yourself in five years? Maybe I'll have built enough residential housing in this remote part of the country or something. There are some things that you can actually put down and you have markers, you know, to have checks and balances. There are others that are very big, especially when we're dealing with human emotions and where we'll be. Life will only tell you, if you'll, fire, if you'll be alive five years from now, you'll remember, oh yes, I was asked this question five years ago. Now, I don't know if that makes sense. It makes sense and I appreciate you bringing that question because I find a lot of people, like you said, especially who have a business background, mm -hmm. you know, people who we see as successful, they ask you that question, where are you going to be in five years? And if you cannot give an answer, you're not serious with your life. Mm -hmm. you, you need, what, what's your one year goal? Five years, 10 years. If you can't say this now, you need to rethink your life and all that. And I just thought right now, the reason why I created this podcast was because for the first time after speaking with psychologists and coaches, I was getting real information and not opinions. Mm -hmm. And it was accepting my journey, the decisions I had made. All the adults I'd interacted with was through their lens. You should be doing this, mm -hmm. you should be doing that, you should be doing that. And these psychologists and coaches acknowledged where I am in my life. All the decisions I've made have been my responsibility. And it's okay, it's not a bad thing. So I said, oh my God, I need to have a space where I'm exploring more of this because they've changed my life, making my life important, especially because I'm an artist, you know, I'm a graphic designer, photographer, videographer. If you tend to look at that career, they're not really considered successful compared with someone who is in banking. You know, you'll hear people being spoken, the MD, the CEO, mm -hmm. banking, we're doing this all over the world, what have you. Artists are not really uh, spoken of in the same mm -hmm. light. Yet I've realized that if this changed my life, I know someone can benefit from hearing this conversation. And which now goes into the next uh, part of our environment not acknowledging that we have multiple intelligences and multiple learning styles. Mm -hmm. So I think what this whole experience has taught me is to find out what your learning style is and put yourself in that area. Yes, so would you mind uh, just sharing with us a little bit more about what are multiple intelligences and multiple learning styles? Okay. Um... For one, you have verbal linguistic learner, meaning spoken word. You have the person who is either a good writer, um, even a politician. You know, there are some people who are blessed in just, you know, talking. Um, you so, also, people, so people that learn through hearing other through people hearing speak. Through hearing and writing also. So that's why it's verbal linguistic meaning language. Basically, they know how to use their language well in the written word or spoken word. Yes. You have musical Rhythmic. So those are the artists, um, instrumentalists, a conductor, singers, basically those artists. You have logical, mathematical learners, and we can already guess those are statisticians, you know, mathematicians, engineers, yeah, engineers like that. Problem solvers, they like patterns. So to speak, yes, with figures, but more specifically, yes, yes with figures. You have. Um, now, intrapersonal, meaning within, people who are able to come up with stuff and create it for others. So most entrepreneurs are intrapersonal learners because they sometimes also have to try their own products or their own services before they can use it on others or sell it to others. You have now interpersonal is where you're relating with others also. So interpersonal before was intra, within. Interpersonal learners are anyone, you know, anyone like in form of leadership where you have to have a follower. It has to be like almost a symbiotic or, uh, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That kind of approach. You have naturalistic learners. These are people who love nature. So botanists, people who do flowers, um, even farmers to some extent, sculptors. 
you know um so those who feel the you know um even marine would you call them people who work in the, the sea water environment sailors uh, not so much sailors <laughs> but i think people who care for the environment so to speak so anyone dealing with environmental issues and concerns has that approach then there are those who are bodily kinesthetic meaning you know gym gym instructors or gymnasts themselves dancers athletes yes athletes like those and then visual visual spatial so also sculptors but having said all that you find someone can have even four of them it doesn't mean you're only one thing i could be a mathematician at the same time an artist at the same time an intrapersonal person because of the psychology you know i remember growing up my parents were like you have to do medicine or they thought it was and i didn't meet the cut <laughs> i always felt music but i ended up i ended up not doing music I ended up doing social sciences and psychology but i'm still able to make use of all those skills attained over the years to be able to just be of service to the world so again but this comes with time and there's no way i would have known my 20 year old self would not have known where my 40 something year old self is today so with all that's been said we can only hope that we get to live a longer life and be able to learn make uh, informed decisions on that and help others who are behind us maybe play catch up or even have better chances but remember you're not responsible for someone else's behavior you can inform them but they also have to make the choice themselves i think the part that has been most let me not say influential but it has influenced me a lot is this the acknowledgement that i have multiple intelligences and multiple learning styles because what i've noticed is the school tends to focus on verbal linguistic and so it's it's like a joke that a learning institution that's not is not aware of learning styles yeah. and is just focused on 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 one so we're not surprised why those who who tend to lean towards verbal and lingu- linguistic you know the a and b students they thrive because that environment has been built for them so we can see why they are thriving the c and d students you know the teacher even though you're trying to beat us mm-hmm. hard on the head mm-hmm. it's not coming in because this is not our style of learning and i've noticed that personally i obviously the you know a mix of everything but I, what comes up is especially bodily kinesthetic you know monkey see monkey do mm-hmm. a little bit of verbal linguistic a little bit of musical Yeah and I guess the interpersonal and I guess the logical mathematical in some sort of way you know mm-hmm. trying to see patterns in yeah. all of this information yeah, now that we are sharing and seeing how we can use this individual patterns for ourselves so I don't know what are your thoughts what has been your experience with this uh, multiple intelligences and multiple learning styles I think for me it's more of just a confirmation of, of what I had been living you know in part of my years especially in my 30s and i realized ah so it's okay you can actually have 3 4 even 5 there are others maybe i haven't yet discovered but if i'm willing to do the homework to dig in and find out and speaking on choices i remember uh, yesterday meeting with uh, an acquaintance and he really had a lot to share on on how business is first of all he brought in the issue of, um how asians the asian community even within kenya have their own groupings you find the shahs keep to themselves the kalasingas keep to themselves you know but when they mean to do business they will really do business but he even ended up saying that even the somali community has even overtaken them and if us kenyans you know are not careful we'll also be overtaken and i think for him what i got was that he had done his homework he he's done business with them for a good number of years and he admired that work ethic and feeling of togetherness because you see um for most Somal- uh, somali communities they will live together they they won't be so big on i have to have a flashy car flashy house for myself if there's a fellow somali we can all live like a family of 3 in one house a two bedroom but they will support each other 
even if it's loaning, giving them a loan, they'll, you know. And I thought, where have we failed as Kenyans then? You know, that was a thought in my head again. I wouldn't say we have failed, but I would say there are a lot of variables that influence our behaviors. Mm-hmm. Maybe one of the influencing factors is they started out as immigrants. Mm-hmm. If you're an immigrant and the place you are is not your home country, then you tend to come together to figure out, okay, what resources can we help each other level up because we're not like the, the these people that live in this country. Mm-hmm. But what about the Somalis that are Kenyan? Yes, so you see now, they started off as immigrants coming here, and now that continued with those who are born here. Oh, okay. So they've had that continued behavior, well as, you know, just like they say, if you're at home, you, you feel comfortable. Ah, oh, okay. There's no sense of, I'm going out there and I'm crushing it, I have to thrive. We tend to see that's an immigrant behavior, or if you look at the fundamental of that behavior, if I'm not at home, I have to push extra mm-hmm. hard. And hence the choice to work hard. Hence the choice to work hard, because it's a life and death situation. Okay. So, you know, I like even what you've said about something we take for granted, that even in business, that friend of yours was learning. Mm-hmm. So what it reminds me of, life is active, active learning. And so if I'm making mistakes, I am now coming, using these tools, coming to ask myself a question, where am I missing? Mm-hmm. Where am I misfiring, if I can say, or where am I, what behavior, what thoughts am I having that's not allowing me to get the kind of desired outcome I want. Mm-hmm. And can and, we also relate that now, like with relationships? Because a lot of what we said is just, um, and to be more specific, romantic relationships. Because yes, there's school, there's work life. He also said something interesting. He was even telling me, I would advise my own sister before she even thinks of marrying or having someone's child to literally live with this man for six months to a year to know if she's sure he's the one and that have a child. And then I thought, you may have a point, but supposing uh, she's of the religious faith where they say, Mm-mm, no sex before marriage, so unless you're adopting a child, there's no way <laughs> you're going to do that. Or, um, I don't know. Again, you see, there are different ways to look at it, and maybe that's a topic for another day. It might be very long, but again, how can we also be active learners in our family romantic situations? That's a very great question, and I think as we go through this process, we can start exploring those things, because now I'm starting to think that men have different intelligences, are using a different intelligence than the ones women women are using, so that's why probably we are are clashing, you know? And even like you've mentioned, Yes, a lot of religion has the stance of Mm -hmm. uh, not living together until you're married. Mm -hmm. And from what uh, the stories I've had, you really don't know someone until you start living with them. So you can date for two, three, five, eight years. And then when you start living, then you're like, oh my God, who is this person? Mm -hmm. That is true. So... At the end of the day, make your choice out of the experience you have directly engaged yourself in. Yes, I have uh, three main takeaways from this whole discussion and chapter. And also just to read the inspiration that uh, had me do this particular podcast with you is it's common to have doubts and fears about making changes. In fact, it's a mark of courage to acknowledge your hesitations to change and your anxiety of accepting greater responsibility for your life. It is no easy matter to take an honest look at your life. Those who are close to you may not approve of or like your changes. They may put up barriers to your efforts. Your cultural background may make it more difficult for you to assume a new role and to modify certain values if you choose to do so. And these factors can increase your anxiety as you contemplate making your own choices rather than allowing others to choose for you. That was the inspiration for me. And my three takeaways are the choice theory, which shares the five uh, pillars 
pillars, which is survival, love and belonging, power or achievement, freedom or independence, and fun. That these are the basic pillars for satisfying our needs. So even when I look at that job or that person uh, that I'm hanging out with as a friend or, you know, the, the lady friend that I'm spending time with, or even, you know, the church uh, that I'm at, or even the job that I'm trying to pursue, or the clients that I'm pursuing, the hobbies I'm involved with, I see all these five pillars coming into play. You know, the sense of belonging. Do I feel safe? Uh, am I achieving anything being in this group? Am I learning anything new? Does it make me feel free, you know? Is that that sense of freedom and independence? Uh, do I feel loved? I guess that's part of the belonging, you know? Survival. Do I feel safe? And is it fun? And I think also what, uh, you know, the relationship with growth involves self-esteem and other esteem. Because I, in, what I've realized in personal development space or conversations, it's been focused on self-care, self-love. It's all about me, full stop. But with this concept of self-esteem um, and other esteem being intertwined, because you can't, until you love yourself, you can't pour it out to others. So it's very important for you to figure out your life, figure out your values, what you stand for, what you prefer, and then also other esteem involves respect, acceptance, caring, valuing and promoting others without reservation. And so we need to strive to understand others who may think, feel and act differently from us. And even as we consider that, we also need to consider the self-esteem that this is the same definition for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That even everything that I've gone through, how can I value that? And then the last point is the multiple intelligences have informed me and humbled me that I don't have to be like that banker, you know. Uh, I don't have to compare myself with this artist, with uh, Saudi Soul, or with LeBron James, or, uh, or President Uhuru Kenyatta. All these are different people, different capabilities, different capacities different support structures, totally different from me. So it has allowed me to acknowledge uh, the multiple skills I have and the intelligences that I have and for me to use them fully to the fullest. <laughs> yes, those are my three takeaways from this. And how about for you? Okay, well, I think for me, it's just one major takeaway. Consciously making the choice to ensure that I'm surviving or I have survival, I'm loved and I love in return um, there's power power to be able to at least um, succeed in what I do or even help others and fun it's so important because um, um, for me making use of the multiple intelligence uh, approach is my being in like Nairobi Music Society, which is a 50-year-old choir, which used to be an all-white affair back in the day. But right now it has all kinds of people, age groups, status, whatnot. And the fact that we meet together, because we don't get paid for our performances. It's the love of the music that brings us together. So ensuring that we are enjoying each other, we are enjoying our own effort, with whatever we try to achieve when we meet over practices and the final performance days. It's, it's a motivator. It's something that makes me like, okay, I'm looking forward to the next concert, you know. When do we do this? I'm being of service to others. I'm making use of my talents and I'm also helping others. When someone tells you, you sang well, you did this, uh, it's a boost to my ego, my esteem, but I'm also helping them. I've been of service and it's fun. It shouldn't be stressful. It should never be stressful. The minute something you love or do starts being stressful, you should start asking those questions. What is, you know, behind that? And um, 
learning to forgive myself and tell myself, okay, that was a wrong choice, if it's a wrong choice, and I move on from there. Because in growth, you won't always be right. You won't always know things. So giving myself that room to be able to sit back and say, oh, okay, what did I learn then? There must be something, even if most of it was on the negative side, what's the positive? And learning, we learn every day. We can't say we've reached the point, the peak of learning. No, no, no. We're still learning. Maybe it's the same thing you're learning, but a different angle now. Yeah, so it's something I look forward to, a choice. Yeah. Wow. You're, you're a psychologist and a musician. Yes. Eish. Well, that's part of music intelligence. <laughs> oh, yes. I remember in high school we were told music is a multidisciplinary approach. Discuss. <laughs> so, what do you mean? This is an essay. Like, okay, so uh, doctors in the, in the uh, surgeons in the room have to have some music to calm them or spur them on. Any other kind of job opportunity that has some form of music or something. So it's like, you know, even raindrops, the sound of raindrops, waves is music to someone else. So it depends on what you define. Wow, yeah, you're making me remember in um, the Dr. movie, Doctor Doctor Strange, yes, in the beginning. <laughs> What, 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 uh, he was listening to, I think there were two songs. I think one was uh, Interstellar Overdrive by Pink Floyd. And I think another one was uh, Shining Star by Earth, Wind and Fire. So, you know, it's funny you say that because, yeah, we take for granted seeing these things. That's their office and they're playing music because that's needed to concentrate. And it's also made me think of, like, for example, I dance kizomba and it's interesting in dancing kizomba which is an angolan partner dance people say it's like the african tango but it's not yeah. but the interesting thing is i've learned more about relationships from kizomba than what i've had from church society sorry for being blasphemous uh, <laughs> but you see when you dance you have to listen to your partner I have to know where their weight is on their left foot or right foot so that now I know when to move and vice versa. So the funny thing is our teacher tells us it's the, the woman is the one who's the, the master. She's like the drum. The drum in music sets the pace of the beat. So I submit to the woman and I also submit to the music. It might not be obvious when you see the dance but it's a very active listening. Because immediately I take my steps, I know where your feet are. I know I can feel you if you're relaxed or if you're not relaxed. So it's really humbled me. And for the longest time, I, I, I felt a feeling I could not articulate, but I think it, it just came recently where it's the first time how it feels like a man and woman being one and submitting to each other in a practical, tangible way. So, wow, multiple intelligences. So if people want to find out more about you uh, so that they can follow you to get more insights, where can they, can they follow you? Are you on social media or you're not sharing any of these insights yet? I'm not, but uh, my email address is linhuma at gmail.com. I'm on uh, Facebook, Mudeo, links Mudeo, mm -hmm. but it's better if you just communicate via email and we can take it from there. Okay, and what, what, what do you specialize in? That's a good question. I'm making use of this whole multidisciplinary approach. Uh, for now, psychology-wise, it's working on one-on-one -on -one, um, with individuals, so more of individual personal therapy. I'm not doing family therapy. There was a time I was doing drug and rehabilitations, but now I believe working with the individual first and then we can figure out if we need to do a broader environment approach. Then I'm also a private tutor at the moment with children, um, grades one to grade three. So you can see teacher, psychologist, dancer, musician, <laughs> anyone can be many things, so long as you make time for them. It's important to make time for the different skills you're good at. All right, thank you for sharing that. Thank yes. you, Andrew. And uh, this is a 
this is a session that we're exploring so hence we need your input also so please what major takeaways did you get from this conversation what do you think you can apply uh, you know what aha moment sparked for you or what pissed you off that, that you heard all this is you learning something about yourself how you're interacting uh, with yourself and with the world so i really do need your help if you've gotten any value uh, from this yes please go ahead and send me a tweet on revenge f gods it's also the same on instagram uh, same on Facebook, Revenge of the Forsaken Gods. Share your insights and uh, share with someone. Hopefully you've gotten a tool where you can uh, understand the choices you've been making, understanding that you can make the changes that you want to make in your life, that uh, you'll experience some of the uh, stages of experiencing when others view you. You know, the resistance they might bring when you try to change. So hopefully you can use all this and if you are using please do share if this has been any value to you share with your friends your enemies make that choice Enemies. <laughs> yes and uh, follow us on all social media handles on instagram on twitter revenge f gods and on instagram revenge of the forsaken gods thank you and make the choice to make your life the way you want it to be till next time